Bonjour à tous, c'est un grand honneur. Hello everyone, it's a great honor for me to launch this webinar on fiscal policies for the fisheries sector for the French platform for international exchange on and coordination of domestic resource, resource mobilization. The resource of domestic resources in the fisheries sector is clearly a topical issue for our platform. It's really unavoidable because it's at the crossroads of ecology and fiscal policies. Therefore, the platform decided to call upon the expertise of academia, and namely Giovanni Okaili, researcher at the International Center for Tax and Development and the Institute of Development Studies. He's carried out a brilliant study in collaboration with our platform. The main objective was to assess current and potential contribution of the fisheries sector to the mobilization of domestic resources in sub-Saharan Africa. He will be the first one to take the floor for our webinar and he will present a summary of his works, an overview of the situation, his main findings from his study. We will then hear from, well, given that we've noted the fact that the contribution of marine resources to domestic revenue is the uh, ba is based on properly managing the resources. We will have Henri Cazella, who will be talking about sustainable fisheries, given the environmental challenges we have to face. And then we have Tristan Irschlinger, who is an expert on the questions of subsidies to fisheries at the International Institute for Sustainable development who will be talking about current negotiations between the members of the WTO on rules to limit subsidies to ensure sustainable use and preservation of marine resources. Before I give the floor to Giovanni, I would like to thank our speakers for having accepted to take part in our webinar. And I would also like to congratulate Giovanni on his work, which is wonderful quality and which is also adapted to the lack of data. But he was really able to come up with the most relevant recommendations possible. So again, thank you to all of you for being here. So for those who are assisting online, this is a French and English webinar. Some will be speaking French, some speaking English, some maybe a mix of the two, but you can choose the language you wish to hear. So each presentation will last about 10, 15 minutes. And please ask any questions through the chat function. And at the end of the presentations, we will submit your questions to our experts. So at the end of all the presentations, and you can also raise your hand and we can open up your mic if you would like to take the floor once we've taken all of the written questions. So enjoy the webinar and Giovanni, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, welcome everyone. So I will be uh, starting sharing my screen and I will give a brief overview of uh, the results of the report. Just allow me a second to make this full screen. Uh, okay, so uh, we will start with a brief overview of the current state of fisheries uh, around the world to then move to the rationale for taxation and then focus specifically about fisheries in Sub-Saharan Africa, its characteristic revenue contribution and a few suggestions on how they could be improved. Uh, the uh, in 2018, uh, fishing production reached 179 million tons in the world, most of which were directed towards, towards human consumption. Uh, most of this production was, uh, was uh, in a few, was taking place in a few countries that top 25 uh, 
uh, marine capture producer uh, in the world account for more than 80% of, of all the production of, uh, of capture fisheries in the world, and that of inland fisheries is even more concentrated. Uh, the production of fisheries has seen different trends over time, but is mostly been increasing uh, in more than doubled in Asia and Africa over the last 20 years, uh, while it decreased in, in, most, in most of the region. Uh, fish produce is increasingly uh, consumed uh, all, all across the world. It represents a very significant share of daily average intake for a vast number of people in the world, most of which are located in, in low-income country. And interestingly, it consumption of, of fish resources has grown uh, more, uh, twice as much than, than the population growth of the population over the last 50 years. Uh, it more than quadrupled in low-income countries, signifying how relevant this type of resource has become. Uh, fish also represent a highly traded commodity. 38% uh, of all of all fish uh, captured in 2018 was traded internationally, and the vast majority of both value and volume of this of this trade was coming from uh, low-income countries. Uh, fisheries also give a very significant employment contribution in many low-income countries. There's about 60 million people that are employed in the sector, about a fifth of uh, which are women. There are differences between harvesting activity and post-harvesting activity. Uh, there's a higher woman employment in post-harvesting activity and, and uh, the number of people involved in post-harvesting is usually higher than that uh, employed in direct harvesting. Uh, there's uh, very many vessels that are, are being licensed all over the world, about you know four and a half million as the most recent statistic. Uh, the vast majority of both vessels and uh, and employment take uh, take place in Asia, but Africa comes comes a distant second. So especially if we look at the composition of the fleet, we can see already that there are some significant differences between uh, the African continent and the Asian continent. Uh, as the fleet in sub-Saharan Africa is predominantly made of, of non-motorized vessel, which already gives an indication of how significant the artisanal sector is, is in, that, in that continent. Uh, the uh, contribution of the artisanal sector is significant in both Asia and Africa. And one of the things that must be kept in mind is that most of the figures that are available for this sector are at best guesstimates. There is an incredible lack of information pertaining the number of people directly employed in the artisanal sector, the number of vessels that are registered or unregistered in the artisanal sector, as well as the actual, the actual catch of the sector of the sector itself. Uh, what has become increasingly clear though is that the growth in production in the number of people employed in this sector is uh, massively unsustainable. As of 2018, uh, more than a third, about a third of fisheries resources in the world are considered overexploited. Uh, this is a continuing trend that is going on for over 40 years. There's been an increase of more than 20% on the, on the number of, of uh, resources that are considered overexploited since the 1970s. As we can see, there are fairly big differences in the level of sustainable or unsustainable biological exploitation in different areas of the world. The Mediterranean represents the most heavily unsustainable fishing ground. Uh, followed by uh, the Atlantic in general, while much of the Pacific is, is still uh, mostly biologically, biologically exploited. Uh, what's also clear is that although both habitat and climate change have played a relevant role in the, in the uh, development of the unsustainability of the fishery sector, uh, overfishing is by far the main reason why there has been a uh, uh, um, a negative development of the utilization of, of these resources. Uh, and importantly, this does not only concern marine fisheries, fisheries but also uh, inland fisheries, for which there is much less data, but the data available indicates that is, is uh, equally under increasing strength.
stress. Uh, there are also some good news, however, which is that there is increasing evidence that the way in which fisheries resources are managed matters quite a lot for their sustainability. So the uh, fisheries that are subjected to more intensive management strategies uh, show a rebuilding of stock over time and eventually a sustainable exploitation. Uh, therefore, understanding uh, which type of fisheries management can be adapted to work in particular situation is uh, very important as the majority of fisheries in the world are still deteriorating as very many fisheries, especially low-income countries, are still open access, as in, uh, meaning that you know, what, whichever actor desires to take part in the fisheries can do so with very little state, state limitation. Now, how to uh, ensure an optimal exploitation, both economical and biological, of open access resources was exactly the reason why uh, academics started looking into the management of fisheries in the 1950s. Uh, for a very long time, uh, most of the focus was uh, on high income countries with very little attention uh, dedicated to low income countries. Um, what this literature has shown is that taxes on catch uh, have uh, the potential to contribute to achieving both a biological and an economical uh, economically optimal exploitation of fisheries resources. But what has also emerged over time is that the rate at which uh, a tax could guarantee an optimal uh, fishery exploitation is generally considered politically unjustifiable. The tax would be too high uh, for, for actors in the fishing industry to accept it without strong resistance. And one of the general issues for, for the optimal management of the sector is that to ensure that um, that fisheries resources are sustainably managed, uh, it will be necessary to strongly reduce the number of people employed in the sector, which is generally uh, politically unappealing for, for most people in government uh, all throughout the world. Uh, as a consequence, there are very few examples of actual application of, of high enough uh, fishing taxes on catch in both high and low income countries. Uh, another equivalent instrument which has received quite a a lot of attention are uh, individually tradable quotas, which uh, have a different set of benefit and, and, and of uh, cons than, than uh, catch taxes uh, and are arguably uh, slightly easier to introduce. Uh, but as of the late 2010s, only 5% of fisheries around the world actually had individually tradable quota as, as a way for the fisheries to be managed. Uh, the, other, uh, the other relevant point to mention about the rationale for taxation is that charging sector-specific taxation on fisheries is only justified once they exhibit a rent, once they've been properly managed for long enough to, to actually have a super normal profit. Uh, before this happens, the only contribution that fisheries can give uh, is the contribution to normal fiscal and also such as corporate income tax, value added tax or pay as you earn, which are the same taxes that are charged on any other economic sector. Uh, there are arguably some fishery specific charges, such as the registration of vessel or various type of management fees, uh, but these are arguably better conceived as, as a price that the fishing industry pays towards its own management rather than a contribution to the general fiscality. And very often these, these, uh, these fees are not sufficient to cover the management cost of the fisheries themselves, which require a lot of investment on, on a variety of different uh, bureaucratic aspects. So if one adds to that the fact that fisheries generally receive quite a high level of subsidies, it then becomes fairly relevant that even in many high income countries, fisheries are actually a net fiscal receiver rather than a net fiscal contributors. Uh, we chop in the questions on how justifiable it is to imagine that, uh, that fisheries could contribute positively to revenue, to revenue generation in low income countries in general and Africa specifically. So, 
if we start focusing on what's happening on the continent, uh, most of the academic interest that's been directed towards the sector is mostly focused on its contribution towards food security, as we have seen uh, protein from fish accounts for a high share of protein intake in many low-income countries, its employment contribution, and, and its role as employer of last resort for rural population who might not have access to many other to many other employment opportunities. Uh, since the mid of the 2000s, there has been a push from the World Bank and other international organizations towards a more uh, economically rational uh, management of fishery resources. So to uh, improve their economic contribution towards the life of developing countries, um, this usually uh, per, uh, included the introduction of some time of license fees, the co-management of the resource between uh, uh, local governments and resource users and central government, as well as pushes towards the closure of the access to the resource itself. So rather than everybody being able to access fisheries, uh, only, only actors who have actually licensed themselves should be able to do so. Um, even in during this push, there wasn't much of a focus on the role of fiscal resources themselves, on, ta on fisheries taxation themselves as a way to improve their, uh, their revenue contribution rather than simply their, their management. Uh, the impact of this long debate that took place during you know, the mid of the 2000s and the mid of the 2010s has been a partial introduction of some of the suggestions that were made it is now fairly common for fishery resources to be co-managed between local government and national government so that uh, some of the revenue from fisheries uh, actually accrues towards local government right now, especially the part from, from the artisanal sector, but there has been very little, if any, move toward uh, closing access to fisheries themselves, which remains mostly mostly open access. However, when we say that fishery remain mostly open access, it's also very important to recognize the duality of the sector in the majority of sub-Saharan African countries. There's two very different type of actors in these sectors. There are industrial actors, mostly from distant water fishing nations, that are generally uh, more tightly regulated and target specific high value species for the export market. And then there's an artisanal sector which uses completely different type of technologies, target other type of, of species, and usually refers to a different set of, of government stakeholders for, for its management. Uh, however, the resources exploited by these two set of factors are, are you know, in, inexorably interlinked with one another because fisheries are very complex biological ecosystems. So that overfishing one species by in the industrial fleet will eventually have an impact on the type of species which are targeted by, by artisanal actors. So that as, as you know, the, the overexploitation of particular species has improved, has increased, uh, the, the impact has started to be felt by artisanal actor too, which have led to uh, uh, rising tensions between these, these type of factors as, as fish stocks generally dwindled and an increase in illegal, unregulated and unrecorded fishing which happens for a uh, different reason between industrial actor and artisanal actor. For artisanal actor, it is mostly a way to react to, to uh, uh, the lack of alternative, uh, uh, alternative um, employment opportunities. And for industrial actor, it's mostly due to the lack of monitoring and surveillance capacity of many of many actors in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's been estimated that uh, European vessel report around 29% of their actual catch, while Chinese vessel reports around 8% of their actual catch. So clearly there is much that goes into uh, unreported fish. Uh, the regulation of the sectors always differs. They are subjected to different type of, of fees, they report to different type of, of government stakeholders. Um, the other, no, I do this. 
the other thing that uh, very clearly emerges is how very little data is available in general on the artisanal sector. Like, you know, there's, there's very little that is known about the number of factors that are involved, the number of fishermen, how much they fish, mostly because this sector is predominantly informal, therefore it's not very easy to be observed by, by state actors. There's more information available, on industrial actors, but again, often there's many doubts about the reported catch level. This lack of data is one of the substantial obstacles to improve the management of fisheries uh, across the continent. Uh, more resources should be dedicated to actually observe and monitor what's going on in the sector. And one of the question is, could these resources actually be generated from within the fishery sector itself? Now, the quantification of the revenue contribution of the sector is virtually absent in the literature. There's very little which is reported. Uh, the, the few things which are known are generally connected to the contribution of fishing agreement between African states and, and the European Union. Uh, these are estimated at around 400 million euro, uh, although there are a variety of other fishing agreements with other, with other distant water fishing nations such as Russia, China, South Korea or Japan, for which very little is actually known because this tends to be fairly secretive. Uh, fishing agreement between between the European Union and African states have generally been subjected to quite a bit of criticism, uh, most of which is, is very fair, but then one of the things that also emerges from this, from this type of, uh, of criticism is that there is a lack on any, of focus on any other type of fishing agreement, mostly because very little is known about other. Um, so we try to provide uh, first, a uh, first estimation of how much this sector can contribute to corporate income tax and value-added tax in five selected countries, Mauritania, Senegal, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Uganda. Uh, we did so through a combination of data requests to revenue authorities and Ministry of Fisheries in, in the selected country, as well as uh, through accessing all of the available data through, through different sources. Uh, what we realize is that uh, very little information is actually gathered by many of the national stakeholders with whom we spoke uh, on, on the contribution of the fishery sector to different accentos. The only country that could give us an exact breakdown of, of the contribution of the sector to the taxando we asked was the was Uganda. Uh, no other country could actually give us exactly how much this sector contributes to corporate income tax or, or other tax handles. Um, what we then moved to was the estimation through available through available public sources. Uh, what we realized once again was that the data was uh, insufficient or of an unsatisfactory quality for estimating corporate income tax contribution, uh, but it was of a good enough quality to try and, and estimate the potential VAT contribution. Uh, that varied very significantly across the different countries that, that we covered, uh, ranging from less than 1% of factual VAT collection in Senegal to about 15% of, of VAT collection in Sierra Leone. Uh, these differences are due to both uh, what is actually subjected to VAT in these countries. So Senegal only charges it on filleted fish, while Sierra Leone also charges it on dried fish or smoked fish. Uh, and also the type of processing that takes place in different countries is only Uganda and, and uh, Senegal have some relevant processing capacity. It is, however, very hard for us to understand how, uh, how reasonable our estimates are because of this lack of data from, on which to benchmark the estimates. What we could have access to was data from the Uganda Revenue Authority that shows us that our estimates are generally of one or two magnitudes of difference. So data reported here is in uh, billions of, of shilling. Uh, so there was in 2018 uh, 1.57 billion of shilling collected from corporate income tax of the, uh, from the fishery sector. Our estimate ranged from one 
to 34 billion shillings. So clearly very, very different figure, very similar figures, very similar differences arose, arose from VAT. But because we could only make this comparison from Uganda, we are not sure if this indicates a very low compliance from the sector in Uganda or, or generally the fact that our estimates are based on data, which is not the best actual basis to make this type of exercise. Um, we also had a look at what emerges from just generally the comparison of different countries in the study. And one thing which is common across the, all of them is really how hard it is to quantify the contribution of the sector. Uh, the number, uh, any, any number that one can find in the literature is subjected to such a wide range that it becomes really uh, complex to, to assess what's the economic contribution of the sector. The, the employment ranges uh, as you know from 4.17 percent to 16 percent for for Mauritania. Similarly, if one looks at the artisanal vessel in Senegal, this goes from the from mid 9,000 to 30,000. So it, it's really it's really hard from the available information to try and and construct. A management, a management strategy that makes that makes a lot of sense. What generally emerges is is that there's more focus from the government on information and revenue generated from export levies and, and the amount of uh, fees paid by, by uh, foreign, foreign vessels for which information is generally available, very little on domestic resourcing. Uh, it also emerges that, that there is uh, a little correlation between what, uh, what the sector contributes in terms of employment and what the sector contributes in terms of GDP and, and of export and of export levies because of, again, the, the different uh, wealth-based, let's, val let's valorize the sector economically, or welfare-based, let's valorize the sector for its development contribution approaches. So, Overall, what you know, what what seems to emerge from the evidence is that rather than focusing on on what's the best uh, fiscal policy for the sector in and of itself for its revenue contribution, uh, the best way to approach the sector is how how can we. Uh, have more data to to devise proper management strategies. How how can we? make so that you know that, that the sector is more sustainable both economically and biologically is managed in in a in a better way and therefore overall will contribute more more to revenue uh, a few things on how this could be done have emerged. Uh, I won't focus much on subsidies because that will be the point of one of the following presentation. But you know, the other the other aspect that really came out is that the role of fishing agreements is very important from the revenue contribution, but they also have a very strong sustainability impact. So so there should be uh, a focus in improving the negotiation capacity of many of many African states so that they they uh, could be able to get a better deal out of, out of the fishing agreements that they have. Uh, it should be uh, make easier for civil society organizations in, in um, African countries to take part in these negotiations so that they could be more strongly reflecting the need of, of coastal communities. There should be more focus on, on monitoring the behavior of distant water fishing nations, both from the distant water fishing countries themselves, that are generally very lax in the replication of, of standards on, on their fleets, and by facilitating cooperation between different, uh, different agencies in, in African states. States. Um, what has emerged also is that very little is known about the co-management of, of fisheries between uh, central and local government and that uh, the contribution of the artisanal sector is still not very well understood as well as the level of subsidies that they receive. Both of these aspects have strong revenue consequences so they should be um, they should be also receiving more focus. Finally, uh, as you know, the vast majority of what is 
uh, exported from African countries is still in its raw state, focusing on processing capacity uh, and developing processing capacity would be very important because this tends to be uh, a formal sector that can guarantee decent employment and because of its formality could also guarantee a decent revenue contribution. Uh, one way to do so could be through a set of different incentives, however, it's not clear if any of the incentives so far taking place uh, have, uh, have actually had any positive contribution. Um, I've probably already gone over time, so I'll stop sharing right now and stop. Merci beaucoup, Giovanni. Merci pour ce, ce résumé de, de vos travaux. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you for summarizing your work. It couldn't have been easy to summarize this work of several months with so much data, so many case studies, so many countries covered. So you haven't been too long. You've been very clear, and I'm sure this will give rise to many questions. Henry Casella, let me turn the floor over to you so that you tell us about fisheries sustainability in the face of great environmental challenges. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for inviting me. Very happy to be able to participate. I'll start sharing my screen. Can you confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. It's working. Great. I would first like to congratulate Giovanni on the quality of his work. I've read the report in its entirety, and I would encourage you all to do the same. It's very well written, interesting, very specific, and clearly answered the questions that were posed in the introduction. Found it very interesting. I won't tell you much about the report because I found it very comprehensive, but I'll share one or two comments that were already raised by Giovanni in his own presentation. I'll talk a little bit about fisheries environment and the three challenges that Africa will have to rise up to in the 21st century. And I'll try to um, share a few conclusions. One interesting question that Giovanni also asked minutes ago was whether the fisheries sector is a net contributor to state budget in developed countries. And if the answer is no, then there's no point really in asking the same question for poor countries. It would be asking a lot of the fisheries sector in developing countries if it wasn't the case for developed countries. How about the end game? Shouldn't it be to create a sustainable sector in light of current and future difficulties? So I'm talking about a narrow path between current vital needs, talking about 200 million people in Africa who live off fishing and a few million people working in the industry at large. And on the other hand, the need to manage a threatened resource. So I'll talk about the environmental challenges to fishing in Africa. The first is climate change. I think this is a recurring theme in many presentations. Every time we just start talking about the, the future and sustainable management, sustainable development. In the case of fishing, the impact is through acidification of water, rising temperatures. With two main consequences. Actually, one, the main consequence is destruction of habitats. So that's 
means decreased productivity of ecosystems, less fish because there's less fish that uh, can survive the destruction of their habitat, whether it's, for example, corals disappearing, etc. And fish disappearing because it's being replaced by invasive species because it migrates. So there's a real risk here. Here's a global view, effort to modelize this. The color goes from blue, positive impact of climate change to red, very negative impact of climate change. So it's the change in maximum revenue potential from the fishing sector. Clearly equatorial countries are the hardest hit. And in fact, African countries are vulnerable, not just because they're equatorial, but because of their low adaptation capacity, because their level of development is pretty low. And so that means they will need resources, extra resources to adapt. What are the potential solutions? Well, there are several, but the main idea is to go towards more resilient ecosystems so that they're able to absorb the shocks that they will be subject to. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge, and I was talking about the health and resilience of ecosystems, the problem of Africa in terms of the fishing sector, particularly as regards sub-Saharan Africa and coastal fishing, is the over-exploitation of fish stocks. So what you see here does not cover all of Africa, only the 13 countries around the uh, Guinea stream, a stream with the number of ecosystems around the Gulf of Guinea. So what you see here is a list of uh, fish that are being fished in that stream. So in red are the species that are overexploited or have disappeared. In white, we don't have data. And in yellow, those are stocks that are being fished at the highest level. So that's just one notch below over exploitation. So very clear that in the Gulf of Guinea, there's a real risk of over exploitation. The third challenge is the equivalent of what's, what we keep hearing about the blue economy, which is being touted as a new revolutionary economy with new capabilities and new opportunities. And the blue acceleration just means that the use of oceans has accelerated over the past 50 years as a source of food, of resources, and of space. So I will now share 12 different graphs with you. And of course, I won't go into the detail of each of those graphs, but it gives you the idea of what the blue acceleration is. The use clearly of oceans is accelerating. See marine protected areas, for example, that's graph K. The protected surface areas have gone up over the past 50 years. So that's something we can happy, be, be happy about. But if you look at non-sustainable activities, whether it's cruise ships, cruise tourism, or um, deep hydrocarbons extraction, clearly through the increase of uses, there's an increase of risks. And those risks are going to clearly disrupt marine ecosystems frontally. In terms of deep sea minerals, exploitation. Scientists have asked for these activities to be suspended because the consequences are unknown. I could give you the example of Tanzanian activities in the Mozambique Canal, which is one of the richest fish zones in the world and one that is critical 
for African ecosystems. And I would also point to you graph L, the extended continental shelf, that's the area where states have their jurisdiction out of the 200, beyond the 200 miles of territorial waters. So areas where no state has sovereignty over the fish stock, but does have so sovereignty over the the shelf itself. So clearly, those total areas have gone up and many countries have required additional areas. And clearly the acceleration is such that soon, if nothing, if that's the trend is not checked, then the whole of the oceans shelves would be under national jurisdiction. Something else that's important is that the productivity of the environment is closely related to the productivity of fishing. which means that solutions that are favorable for the environment are also favorable for fishing. So this is an archetype of the common goods. And one of the conclusions of research into the commons is that it can be favorable or to, to favor local bandits as against uh, roving bandits. This is the idea that in commons, it's difficult to limit access, but if you use the resources locally, then outsiders won't be able to use those resources. So individualist behavior is a way of what well, leads to extinction of the resources. But roaming bandits can be more sustainable. No, sorry, resident ones can be more sustainable than roaming bandits. Because once they've depleted one environment, they just move on to the next. So when I was preparing this presentation, this question of local bandits and is really linked to small scale fishing. And there's also piracy, for example, was actually a way the means to of self-defense against illegal fishing in territorial waters. So there are fiscal tools, incentives. So in Giovanni's report, it talks about a lot of systems for small-scale fishing, services to the environment, aspects to do with local management. But here we need more data, more research. And I would like to highlight the other aspect. In West Africa, industrial fishing is 1% of the fleet, but 75% of all captures. But this sector is extremely opaque. First of all, fishing agreements, as Giovanni said, but also naturalization of foreign vessels. So how is it that a vessel can obtain a state flag from Ghana or from Liberia so that they can fish outside of fishing agreements in a non-sustainable manner? And in the literature, I think this hasn't much been studied. And so what are the consequences? What So what are the types of agreements? There are joint ventures, there are a variety of possibilities, but there's very little known about these. And then of course, there's not enough funding for research. Another possibility would be to regulate these economic activities, especially those that threaten other activities. So for example, um, 
drilling for oil or tourism. And there's also a regional dimension to fishing because fish have no borders. And a problem in one country can lead to problems in others because fish tend to migrate. There are also ocean currents. So there are negative externalities, but also positive externalities. If you can agree on pooling means, pooling objectives, because it's very important to impose penalties and fines, but these have to be aligned from one country to the next. So be important to reinforce regional fisheries management organizations to increase training, to enable them to better negotiate fishing agreements. Because this would be in the, it's in the best interest of everyone to have sustainable exploitation. So increase inspections. And then to finish on a positive note very quickly, well, first of all, technological progress has now enabled us to capture an incredible amount of data. We can follow fishing fleets remotely. There is a lot of data out there. And so transparency of data, including by local fishermen, makes this data highly available and useful. And then in the fishing sector, these are often dynamics that are impossible to slow down or to reverse. But in the fishing sector, if you limit capture, you could see great improvement. And this is the case in the Atlantic seaboard in France, for example. So I will stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Henri, for giving us this overview and ways to move forward and for ending on a positive note. Unfortunately, it does confirm, well, your presentation confirms that uh, there is very clear over exploitation of marine resources. So we really have to improve management. And I will now give the floor to Tristan Erslinger to talk about, as I said in my introduction, current negotiations between members of the WTO to limit subsidies to improve sustainability of marine resources. Tristan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here to talk about fishing subsidies and negotiations underway at WTO. Congratulations to Giovanni and Henri for their very excellent presentations. And thank you, Giovanni, for this excellent report. So by way of introduction, here is a graph which shows, so it's the same message as what we heard in the previous presentation. So increasing overexploitation of marine resources around the world. So this is from the latest FAO report on the fishing fisheries sector in the world. You can see there's 34% of overexploited resources, whereas the underexploited resources is constantly decreasing and now stands at 6%. So very little room for increasing fishing. In these slides, this illustrates the situation in just one part of Africa. So the study goes back to 2004, but it shows how striking the effects of over exploitation are. So here you can have the different use the difference in the concentration of the abundance of some types of fish, the small pelagic species, you could see that it was very high concentration in the 1960s as compared to 2000. And one of the major factors, factors that contributes to this decrease is overfishing with the consequences that we are well aware of on fish stocks and local populations who depend on the fish. So now there are negotiations at WTO 
So these were launched through recognition of the fact that fishing subsidies could contribute to overexploitation. So making fishing profitable in situations where it wouldn't be if there were no subsidies. So this negotiation started a while ago. Over 20 years ago, there have been various phases, more or less active ones, up until 2015, with where there was new momentum impulsed by the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. We were hoping that they would come to a closing in 2020 and then 2021, but both times there were delays, namely because of COVID-19. So it was impossible to carry out in-person negotiations. However, given this process, we're closer than ever to an agreement and to bringing together all of the uh, varying positions, which are now finally converging. So hopefully there will be an agreement in 2022. The main question is whether the members of the WTO will be coming back to the negotiating table with renewed motivation in 2022. So as for the scope of application, the new rules that are being negotiated, so there's a draft negotiation tabled by the chair of the WTO, which would apply to all fishing, so sea fishing and activities linked to sea fishing. So not aquaculture, not inland water fishing and activities that can take place on land, infrastructure, processing, etc. That's not covered by the negotiation. It's important to note that a subsidy, as understood at the WTO, can take on several forms. There's a traditional sense of transferring funds, but there are other mechanisms which are also considered as subsidies, including foregoing public revenues. Some sectors are taxed, some others, of, well, the taxes are waived. There's also the fact that governments can provide goods and services at a reduced cost. There's also a rev revenue and price support through government intervention. And then, so the agreement would cover only a specific agreements, which is a WTO term saying that these are interventions which benefit one sector or a group of sectors and not the entire economy. So what rules are we talking about currently at the WTO? Well, there are mainly three pillars in these negotiations. The first would be to forbid all subsidies to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. The second would be a prohibition to subsidize the fishing of stocks which are already considered to be overexploited currently. And we've seen that there are quite a lot of those. And then the third pillar would be, well, the main rule here is we prohibit subsidies which favors overfishing and overcapacity more broadly. So there are a number of cross-cutting questions. The most important one is certainly the uh, special but differentiated treatment of developing countries. This is a principle applied to the WTO because the, the developing countries don't need to make the same commitments as developed countries. So those are the new rules for the current negotiations. So on IUUF, how would this work? In this draft negotiation, there would be a prohibition to subsidize ships and operators who carry out illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing activities. So either for coastal states in their sovereign waters or for the flag state or through a regional fishing management organization, especially for fishing in the high seas where there's no sovereignty. So states that subsidize fishing can modulate the uh, duration of the prohibitions, but there would be a minimum duration and then special and differentiated treatment for developing countries is relatively limited. So there's a grace period. So the prohibition would apply 
But there would be no dispute regulation for two years. So the way it's applied is different. It would be a little bit less rigid, a little bit less stringent for this two year period. Concerning overexploited stocks, the principle is similar. There would be a prohibition to subsidize fishing. Once a determination that a given stock is overexploited has been carried out either by the coastal state for their own national waters or by a regional fisheries management organization. It's important to note, however, that there is some flexibility in this draft agreement, which says that you can subsidies can, can continue as long as the uh, subsidies or other measures are implemented to reconstitute stocks at a sustainable level. So if some management actions are taken, then subsidies would be authorized. And then the uh, special and differentiated treatment would be the same as for the previous prohibition for illegal fishing. There would be a two year grace period. So prohibition would apply but they would not be brought before the, uh, the court of uh, arbitration for a two year period. The third pillar, so overfishing and overcapacity. And this is a, a broader pillar in terms of what it covers. So there'd be one main rule and then two minor rules. So the main rule would be that subsidies that contribute to Overexploitation and overcapacity would be prohibited, which means that there would be a list of certain types of subsidies which would be considered as subsidies which favor overfishing and overcapacity. So, renovation of, of ships, purchasing machines and equipment, uh, fuel, for example. And again, there's also flexibility as for the previous two pillars subsidies could continue as long as there are measures put in place for sustainable management of fisheries. It's important to note that the special but differentiated treated for developing countries is a little bit more important here because these rules also have a broader application, cover more subsidies. So there would be a transition period for all developing countries in their coastal waters, in their exclusive economic zones, but also the regions covered by regional fisheries management organizations. There would be a permanent exception for the smallest countries, for the least advanced countries, as well as those that represent uh, less than 0.7% of all world captures. There's also a permanent exemption for all developing countries for small scale fishing, which means that some countries that represent more than 0.7% would still be allowed this exemption. Very briefly, there are two other prohibitions concerning fishing in international waters, as well as boats that are not fishing under the flag of the, uh, the state. So now a few key figures for Africa to see what some of the implications would be of these prohibitions, which are currently being negotiated at WTO. Several estimates and studies. I think the last study that I have awareness of is that 85% of stocks fished are fished above sustainable levels, 28% of very alarming levels. And the second element is that non-African fleets operating in Africa represent a substantial share of what's captured. So one third of the captures for all stocks and all types of fishing, 45% for industrial fishing, so even higher. And these non African fleets are supported by about 724 million US dollars in subsidies. 
It's important to remember that when you think about the implications of this agreement. Africa is one of the regions that provides the fewest subsidies for fishing, just 3% of all uh, subsidies. But most of these government subsidies in Africa are in the form of subsidies that would increase fishing capacity. So this might be prohibited under the agreement because if you increase capacity in a context of overfishing, this could lead to levels which are not sustainable. And Africa is also the uh, region which awards most of its subsidies to small scale fishing, which is 34%. And one last slide to see what some of the implications would be from this agreement. First of all, one can estimate that since there are few subsidies in Africa, there are few defensive interests to protect the current situation in Africa. This might be less the case in the future, but so far, defensive interests are relatively limited as compared to other regions which subsidize more. So now as for subsidies provided by African states, they tend to increase fishing capacity. Therefore, the question would be in a context where resource management can be improved, could a reform be useful? And or maybe an assessment of the impact of the subsidies would be useful to see if really it would be favorable to sustainable development and the sustainable profitability of the fishing sector. that small-scale fishing is very uh, large in Africa. So that poses the question of how useful flexibility is for this type of uh, fishing. Would it be a better idea to have permanent flexibility or should it be temporary so that there's still some encouragement to manage uh, fishing and reform subsidies in case that subsidies actually uh, promote unsustainable fishing practices. In terms of implementation, you could ask the question of what will be necessary to implement this agreement and I think the short and the long of it is that it will be important to put in place coordination mechanisms that allow management authorities and subsidy authorities to work together. And to make sure that subsidies being granted or not granted be dependent upon management decisions. That would be important. In the case that some subsidies are banned by the agreement, they will have to be reformed or reinforce the fishing management measures that would make it possible to continue with those types of activities or interventions rather. From the offensive point of view, you can really see those rules, this agreement as the next tool to fight against IUU fishing and overfishing. Clearly, IUU fishing, and that's widely recognized, is a global country, is a global problem, but a problem that is particularly uh, that particularly affects Africa. So that would be one way to dissuade the fleet from engaging in, in IUU fishing by telling them that they run the risk of losing their subsidies, knowing that many of these fleets are only profitable thanks to the subsidies. So that could act as a deterrent. And lastly, maybe it's an opportunity to decrease the foreign um, fishing pressure, particularly on overexploited stock or when there are subsidies that actually promote overfishing so that African countries can capture a larger share of the benefits generated by the fish stock in their EEZ. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take your questions if there are any.
Tristan, c'était encore une fois très Thank you, Tristan. Once more, this was extremely clear. Thank you for those excellent presentations. I was following the chat uh, at the same time as I was listening to you, and I've noticed a few questions that are being asked of each and every one of you, so maybe I can actually distribute, so to say, those questions to, to you. But if you don't want to answer for the time being, uh, just tell me and I can uh, um, move on to the next question. Henry, in terms of over-exploitation, over-fishing, which players are responsible for the kind of overfishing that we're seeing? Henry? Yes, we have to know who the stakeholders are, who the players are. It's the foreign fleets, it's the nationalized foreign fleets, it's the local fleets. But I think the main reason for overfishing is the fact that there's no centralized or global management in place. The question is what the ecosystem can absorb, what's the number of fish and how they're being uh, fished, that's very important. But because there's no monitoring of what an ecosystem is able to absorb, what level of shock an ecosystem is able to absorb, everybody's fishing. And in terms of how the quotas are distributed, except sometimes in developed countries, there's no granular monitoring. What I said about budgetary or tax figures is also true of fish populations. Most African countries, we don't have precise figures about those fish populations. Tristan, maybe you want to add something? The question also cropped up during your presentation, including how do subsidies lead to over-exploitation? What are the possible penalties? And another interesting question is how can we distinguish clearly between small-scale informal fishing and the large thieves or bandits, and how can sanctions or tax policies play a role without marginalizing small-scale artisanal fishermen? So those are some of the questions that were asked during your presentation, Tristan. Maybe you can try to answer those. Yes, suddenly. In terms of overfishing and who is responsible for it, completely agree with Henry. I would just say that we had studied a number of fisheries around the world to see what the impact of WTO rules were, for example, Sardinelle in Western Africa. And what we saw in this specific case is that it's true that sometimes there are such different types of fishing with such different species that there's no direct competition over the same stocks. But in some cases, there is real competition. For example, for small pelagic fish and sardinelle in uh, West Africa, there are huge industrial fleets that are actually in competition with artisanal fishermen. So those create the, those types of situations that are highly conflictual because there's a bias, of course, for large industrial uh, feeds that receive the most subsidies and that happen to be in many cases distant water fishing fleet. So the other question, how do subsidies create overfishing? I would say that it's a little bit counterintuitive in the fishing sector in that uh, the more effort you put into producing, the more you actually don't produce. The production curve looks very different than 
in other sectors where the more input you put, the more output you get. In fishing, you're highly dependent on the ability of fish to reproduce. We harness fish that's produced by nature, but we need to take into account the regeneration, replenishment ability of stocks. And in terms of subsidies, in light of the type of subsidies you're looking at, it may or may not promote an increase in the fishing effort. If you subsidize fuel, the only way to benefit from that subsidy is to consume more fuel and hence fish more. Yet fishing more does not necessarily mean catching more fish. So in some cases it leads to decreasing yields or to not disappearing stock, but to dwindling stock of stocks at a very low level compared to what it could be. And partly that's due to fishing subsidies. Other questions perhaps? Yes, there's one about sanctions, penalties. If there's no WTO agreement, there are no penalties, no sanctions, at least globally in terms of overfishing, except within RFMOs, because some of them do have fairly strict quota systems. And the fact that you fish over the quota uh, may lead to sanctions. But those are fisheries that have a great commercial value, but it's far from being all of the stocks, all of the species. Under the WTO subsidy agreement, it could give rise to commercial sanctions that are part of the arsenal of legal tools available uh, for WTO. So that could give rise to a, a new encouragement to overhaul and rethink subsidies that may lead to overfishing, overexploitation, etc. Thank you very much, Tristan. Yes, I think you've answered most of the questions that have been asked of you. Let me go back to an observation that was made at the very beginning of the presentation, and that was for Giovanni. I'm going to try to slow down a little bit for interpretation. The question on processing. Because indeed, if we go back to the initial question, that led us to uh, commission this study and to get this report. The question was how much taxation budgetary resource could be derived from fishing. Taxation is a tool, of course, but taxation also creates distortions. Economists know that. And clearly, as you said, Giovanni, that was the whole idea in this sector. The idea was to voluntarily create uh, distortions so as to lead to an optimal preservation of the resource. But as you did note, politically, it's not acceptable in light of the level of taxation that would be necessary to have proper management of this resource, but also, which you explained in the report very clearly, specific sectoral taxation would only be justified if there existed an economic rent, that is, if there was a reduction of access to a resource, because it's not the case. I think, I think this is a permanent, uh, pertinent observation because the only way that we can have an influence is through traditional taxation so would the only answer be developing the high value added um, activities? I think you gave the example of Senegal and Uganda where there's a lot of added value activity, less in Mauritania and none in Guinea. Uh, what would be your answer to that? Would you conclude that on the medium term, that's actually the only way that we can mobilize resource, more resources? improve resource mobilization in this sector? Is there a correlation between processing and resource mobilization? Did you see that in the context of your study or not? Um, so definitely, you know, in theory, there should be uh, 
there should be that correlation. Like in practice, because of the lack of actual of actual data, <clears throat> it wasn't it wasn't as easy it wasn't as easy to observe that directly in the context of the study we could not get any any actual collection figure from senegal for example where there is a lot of, of processing taking place so that is that is uh, slightly hard to observe from the data but there is no reason to uh, to suspect a priori that that shouldn't be the case there is however a couple a couple of observation needs to be made uh in the case of uganda where we had we had you know fairly long discussion with some of the officials that are uh, that are involved in the in the taxing of the fishing sector one of the things that was noticed was that as it is often the case in many in many uh, sub-saharan african countries but not only sub-saharan african countries there were a series of incentives in place to, to attract processing capacity on the on the Ugandan side of, of the of Lake Victoria rather than the Kenyan and, and the Tanzanian side of, of the lake. Um, lots of processing was taking place in Uganda, but then to attract those companies, they had a 10 years tax holiday for all corporate income taxes. So, so a very, a very important potential source of, of uh, normal fiscal revenue was given up in advance by the state in order to, to acquire to acquire some processing capacity in the first place. And, and what, what uh, then happened was that uh, companies were finding the most creative solution after the 10 years expiration of their tax holidays to just simply you know, relocate or change their raison d'etre so to, so to access from scratches, from scratches these, these tax holidays again. Uh, and that is generally one, one of the um, issues that, that come out when, when tax incentives are provided for specific uh, industrial policy. Uh, there well might be cases uh, where, where uh, tax incentives have, have a strong fundamental to be put in place, uh, but there's also many cases where it's not obvious how how they will contribute in the long run if they are not managed in in a correct way. Uh, Mauritania is another case where where some of that can be seen. I mean, there there are Mauritania is a very big uh, sector for <clears throat> for fish meal. Uh, that that was also produced was also you know incentivized by the state uh, with a series of of uh, of tax exemption for the initial setup that led to a massive a massive competition between the fish meat industry and other type of normal fishing industry. Uh, one thing that is often is often uh, absent uh, when tax incentives are introduced and, and, and you know and lacking you know, lacking tax incentives, um, the argument often made is that is that no firm will find it profitable to come in and start investing in it, which is again something that's questionable in and of itself. But once these tax incentives were introduced, they're quite never assessed. I mean, there's there's long times before before any tax expenditure study is 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 made, and that is one of you know the interesting point that connects to Tristan presentation too. That exactly you know the type of subsidies which is which is under discussion of the WTO does not cover any type of processing activity. Activity, anything that takes place on land will not be part of, of the discussion. Uh, uh, so, so the prohibition of other types of subsidies might actually give uh, to some African states the idea of focusing more on that side of, of, of the value chain or, or where actual value addition is created. Uh, but, but that should not be made you know, without some some proper uh, studies and assessment, you know, over a regular period of time, you know, there's an optimal way of introducing tax incentive, which is quite never uh, followed, follow through. And the other thing that makes it, you know, interesting for for uh, the type of, of discussion that's going on in the WTO uh, for, you know, the creation of, of, of value addition. One can argue that the industrial fishing does still more value addition of artisanal fishing because the way in which the fish is caught in the first place might lead to easier processing down. 
the land. So that leaving artisanal artisanal subsidies in place for a while could help, you know, could help the development of an artisanal fisherman into an industrial fisherman over time, which is behind some of the conversation on leaving those in place for a while. Uh, if my understanding is correct, any country that wants to keep subsidy in place will have to declare these subsidies to the WTO in the first place. Uh, and that would be the ideal moment to actually start looking at in the impact to follow the subsidies. I mean, tax expenditure studies are still very much lacking in, in many sectors, in many, in many sub-Saharan African countries. And you know, these, these opportunities should be taken right now to actually have a look at the economic impact of, of many of many of those of those things. So like you know long like to go back to the question is is focusing on value addition uh, the best way to increase revenue mobilization. Uh, yes, it probably is. Then how 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 that is done in practice, you know, how that that is the that is the, the, the big question, you know, how how do you involve all of the actors that are already in place? How how much are you able to to coordinate the different actors as as you know it was it was also mentioned in, in both presentations there's you know fish moves across different areas and, and therefore both regional actors plays a role but what happens in one country impact all the other countries around uh, so, so you know, there's a variety of, of international bodies that you know could play a role in 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 supporting a more um, rational use of some of these resources. Uh, but I'll also, leave it to the floor if there's anything else that has happened in between. Merci beaucoup, Giovanni. Effectivement, Thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you for this. Uh, answer which shed light. It's true. The issue of tax expenditures on one hand, which we're well familiar with within our platform. And of course, the starting point for everything. So tax incentives or subsidies for processing. The starting point is transparency on costs and on the impact of those subsidies or uh, her microphone has been cut off. Sorry. So thank you for your answer. Fabienne, what should we do now? Should we, should we open up people's mics? I, nobody's raised their hand. Everything is in the question and answer. So there are two new questions in Senegal. Yes, there are processing act activities. Giovanni mentions this in his report. So should we consider national and international actors as complementary or can are they uh, can they be substituted one for the other? So I don't know if anyone would like to answer one or the other of those questions. And I can give a start because that also connects to one of the previous question on, on roaming bandits versus local artisanal one. I mean, the, the, it is compulsory for every state to live to live you know, potentially open access to its own exclusive economic zone if they are not in a situation of sustainably exploiting the resource. That's part of the law of the sea. So, so on, on the one hand, that could lead to think that you know, the two actors could be, you know, either complementary or substitutable, right? Because, you know, if, if I do exploit, but, you know, completely uh, in a sustainable way my own resources, then I am under no obligation to leave, to leave anyone else access to my own exclusive economic zone. But then if I am not capable of doing so, at that point, I am, I am forced, to do, forced to do so. Uh, if the question is for a better collection of fiscal resources, I mean, then, the, you know, on, on that side, uh, it's, it's, how, it's how these actors are, are, you know, what type of capital access these actors have, what type of knowledge these actors have. Like we've, we've, we've focused, uh, we, we said how, how much the resources are, are uh, fisheries resources are traded nowadays. I mean, a lot of the trade 
doesn't take part in value addition also because of non uh, or, or non tariff or non tariff restriction for access of some of the market you know right now there is very little knowledge in many african countries on how to process on how to process uh, uh, fish in a way that will allow that to be exported in european countries so there could be a lot of a lot of scope for for uh, a coordination between between the international actors and local actors on that on that particular aspects there's there's role for coordination or research activities i mean there's no there is no reason a priori where one wouldn't want international international coordination is how how that is set up how how uh, much the interest of both parties into the agreement behind it are, are are valued in the situation that take place that really that really matters so in an ideal world you know they are complementary because there's different knowledge in, in different places and over time you know this knowledge should be developed nationally but i see that tristan also has his hands up just to very quickly add to what giovanni said which i agree with completely just to say something about the question of interaction between local and international actors whether they should be complementary or substitutable. This reminds me of an interesting study that I'll try to put in the chat. I think I have the link somewhere. It's a study by the FAO, which assesses that if African fleets captured the same amount as the non-African fleets captured, they could generate eight times more economic value than revenues currently generated by access agreements. And this raises the whole question of short-term versus long-term. How can one move in the same direction in this transition phase? I think this clearly shows that there's more value in local exploitation. But this is now the question of how incentives can be set up and how to create this sort of dynamism. So Giovanni said uh, FAO 2014. Is that the reference you're talking about? Okay, I've just found it. Uh, here's the link. Great. Thank you very much. And I think if there are no further questions, I think we've pretty much covered all of the questions. Therefore, I think that I can now thank our speakers for the very high quality of their presentations and of their answers to the questions and thanks to all of you for having taken part in this webinar uh, enjoy the rest of your day thanks again to all of you in particular to our three speakers for their talks thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you everyone it's been a pleasure thank you thanks, bye, bye.